Jesus everything now I gladly own him as my king now my rapture soul can only sing Welcome to First Baptist Church, North Kansas City. We are so very pleased that you are here with us to worship uh, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. So there is an old uh, church tradition, and some of you may need a refresher. Some of you may not be familiar with this tradition, but when one says, Christ is risen, then the response back is, He is risen indeed. So let's do that a few times. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Praise be to God. He is risen, and we have lots of reasons to celebrate and worship today our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Again, we are so pleased that you are here to worship with us today on this special occasion, Resurrection Sunday. Lord, we come thoughtfully, prayerfully for our time of worship, our time of fellowship, to give you praise, to give you honor, to give you glory, to be reminded. That he is risen. He is risen indeed. Praise be to our God. Amen. Amen.
just on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten and nailed to a cross of to see the pain written on your face bearing the awesome weight of sin every bitter thought every evil deed crowning your blood stay proud
Darlene coming to pray? <laughs> there, there she is. Okay. Let us bow and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so blessed to be able to come today to worship your name. As we take this Sunday to, to remember what you did for us, you came as a lowly baby to, to, and, to, and you didn't come to the grave, you came to the, to the shepherds. And you, you it, during your life on, on this earth, you showed us what God, who God really was. We thank you that even though you were the perfect, perfect and sinless, you went to that cross and took all of our sin and our shame and our guilt so that we could have a life with you and that we could have fellowship with you. I cannot even imagine what it was like on that cross that day. And we thank you for, for you, for the resurrection and what it means to us today. Help us never forget that. And my prayer would be today, if there's someone in this in this building or listening to us on a, online, that if you do not know the saving grace of Jesus Christ, that this may be the, the day, this may be the Sunday that you reach out to him and ask him to, to come into your heart. We pray that you would be with the service that follows or with, with Mike as he preaches and that you be given all the glory and the honor that you deserve. And we thank you and thank you so much for everything you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Scripture reading. First uh, Corinthians fifteen fifty one through 55. Listen, I am telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. For this corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal body must be clothed with immorality. When this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory? Where death is your sting. Amen. We're going to sing a song. Just thank you, Jesus, for the blood. This is a new song, but it sounds like a lot of old hymns. But there is some new things in here. In verse 3, I love the way this is put. You took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. So we're going to sing this together. If you're able to, let's stand and sing, Thank You, Jesus, for the Blood. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind.
I had actually meant David to read that scripture right now, but that's all right. <laughs> and uh, so that scripture that he read earlier, I believe where I'm from could be paraphrased in the phrase, ain't no grave. <laughs> Gonna hold this body down, and I forgot my book. <laughs> so um, I, I have said because I have lived south of 70 in Missouri and north of 40 in Arkansas. And those people are all the same. We are all the same. <laughs> but we, one of my pastors used to say, you know, I don't know if you grew up like this, but we get in trouble if we said ain't. Anybody get in trouble if you said ain't? But... One of my very educated pastors used to, and he would tell us, I use the word ain't for emphasis. So, when we sing this together, when we sing Ain't No Grave, that's what we're doing. We're doing it for emphasis. Bear with me, I, I'm almost ready. But let's sing this together. Ain't no gray. Offering, if the ushers would come while we'd sing this song. <clears throat> Shame. 
as a prison, as cruel as a grave. Shame is a robber and has come to take my name. Love is my redeemer, lifting me up from the ground. Love is a power where my freedom song is found. There ain't no grave. Thank you so much for what you've done and however we say it, whether we say it in the first service, like crown him with many crowns, or we sing it like that, or we sing low in the grave he lay, but up from the grave he arose, or whether we sing it, Christ the Lord is risen today, hallelujah, or whether we sing ain't no grave, or thank you for the blood, God, we thank you for all that you've done, and we celebrate your resurrection, God. We know you died. And it's for us. should have been us. You did it for us. And we thank you. We praise you. Thank you for conquering sin, hell, and death. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Welcome once more to First Baptist Church, North Kansas City. We are so pleased that you are here to worship with us today. I do want to express appreciation to Alan, to the praise team, to the choir, to the handbell choir, 
to the readers, to Alan playing guitar, playing piano, doing vocals. <laughs> Truly, we've experienced a wonderful time of worship. It started with Good Friday service, and this is um, just continuing today as we worship the risen Savior, Jesus Christ. We will be in Matthew 28 um, today. So if you have your Bible, I'd appreciate if you'd turn to Matthew 28. We'll be starting with verse 1. I will say that this is a parallel passage that goes in Mark 16 and Luke 24 and John 20. That this is a passage of importance that all of these gospel writers, all of these evangelists have written about it. And they've written about it profusely. They have written a great amount of the gospels are written about Passion Week. The week that started last Sunday with Palm Sunday and led to Good Friday and to today Resurrection Easter Sunday. So a substantial a part of what we call the gospels, what we call the good news is about this week and this day and our resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's take a look at the word. And then you also have a worship bulletin. And in that worship bulletin, it has some headers like obstacles, observations. It has objections and our response. So when you look at those, know that those are going to be applications of us going through this passage of Matthew 28, 1 through 10 together. So as we start Matthew 28, after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Well, it was important for me to reference that there are details that are left in the other gospels. Some of those details, these, these dear devoted women are on their way to the tomb. We know from the other gospel writers that they are expecting to see a dead Jesus when they get to the tomb. That's one of the things, that they have spices that they've prepared to complete the preparation of the dead Savior, Jesus Christ. It was hurriedly started on Good Friday by Joseph of Arimathea. He quickly had started it. These ladies are going to continue to take care of the deceased Jesus. That's what they're expecting. They also, from the other gospel writers, are wondering, um, we've got a problem, I don't know how we're gonna do it, but there is a stone, and that stone is 2,000, 4,000 pounds. How are we going to roll away the stone? That stone separates us from um, getting to Jesus, to take care of Jesus. So they're wondering these things. It is, you note, know, at dawn, they probably didn't sleep all night. They were thinking about the, uh, the obstacles that would be in their way. They were thinking about wanting to take care of Jesus and anoint him further and prepare him, his body for his permanent placement of death. And so they were pondering these things and wondering these things as we learn from the other gospel writers. Then verse 2 in Matthew 28, there was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. So verse 3, his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. And so we know that there was also a great earthquake that uh, shook the earth at Jesus' death on Good Friday, that the veil of the Holy of Holies in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. We know that this is momentous, that the earth moves at Jesus' death and at Jesus' resurrection, at his risen body in this occasion. So in, on Good Friday, the veil was torn, the veil was torn, the veil separated everyone from the place that they considered that God was dwelling, the place of God's dwelling, the place where they would go and make sacrifices for atonement of sin, and the veil was torn. The only person that could go in there was be the chief priest, and that was only for the atonement of sacrifice. And the veil was torn. That obstacle, that barrier of separating people from their Savior, people from their Lord, that was torn, that was dissolved, that was taken away. And today we have the stone that is separating from getting into Jesus from his people who love him. That stone, that barrier is removed. It's important to know that the devotion of these women, that they were so fixed 
and I'm going to go to the tomb. And their uh, devotion, their love for Jesus was so great. Here's the deal. Here's how love often works. Here's the love, how the love of Christ does work. It works this way. For those women who had no position in society, those women who had no means of removing the stone, those women so love their Savior, Jesus Christ, that they were, I don't know how we're going to do this. I love the Lord. He is my Savior. I want to go to be with Jesus. We'll figure it out. So love in action. Love just goes. Love just moves. And they go. Without having all the answers figured out, without knowing all the means and methods, without knowing all the ways that they're going to get into that tomb, are the guards going to help them? Probably not. How will they get in? Without knowing all the answers, love still moves. Love still acts. Love still responds. Love still takes the next step. And so the women, they went. Well, we get to this, this, this angel had come and had rolled away the stone and they created this open, open way, pathway for them. It's important for us to know that the stone was not rolled away so that Jesus could get out. We know that Jesus later appears in his resurrected body in a locked room with the disciples without ever having knocked on the door, without anyone ever having answered the door. He's in their presence. He does not need anybody to give him access. He's a full access savior. He can move through any barrier. He can get to you. All right? He wants us to remove barriers from you getting to him. The things in our lives that get in the way from us getting to him. But he can get to you. So the stone wasn't rolled away so that Jesus could get out. The stone was rolled away so that they could get in. And so the stone is rolled away. The barrier is taken down. And we see that this angel is ministering to Jesus at this time. And in so doing is proclaiming the deity of Christ. That he is God. He is proclaiming the deity of Christ, and the angels have ministered to Jesus and been a witness and a testimony to his deity since Gabriel predicted his birth. The multitude of angels were at Bethlehem. Glory to God in the highest heaven and earth, and on earth peace they proclaimed and they sang at the birth of Jesus. They warned Joseph of Herod's plot to kill Jesus. They were there to minister to Jesus after he'd been tempted by the devil. An angel came to strengthen Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was praying and he had the weight of knowing what lied ahead of him. The scourging, the mocking, the crown of thorns, the crucifixion. What human can face those things without angst? And Christ, being fully human and fully God, knew that angst. Christ, being our God and our Savior, also knew the human condition, the weight of our sin, the cost of our sin, a sin debt that needed to be paid and the people that needed to be redeemed. And that weighed on him, the human condition, sin and death. But an angel came and had ministered to him. Angels will continue to minister and proclaim Christ and honor him and show his deity at his ascension and on his second coming. But there is significance in the angel descending and rolling away the stone. There is significance in the angel being a witness that Jesus is God. But the angel has a message. It's the, it's, it's the sermon today. The angel is going to preach the sermon today. And it's verses 5 through 7. The angel announces the resurrection. And here's the message. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. You're looking for a dead man. He is not here. He is risen. Just as he said. So that's the setup. He is risen just as he said. He is not here. You're looking for a dead man, but you're not going to find him. 
You're not going to find him. There were many times that Jesus had proclaimed and, and, and told the disciples that he would die, that he would be handed over to the rulers and that they would um, have him killed and that he would be buried and that he would rise. He had done this when he fed the 5,000. He told them again shortly after his transfiguration. He told them again on his way to Jerusalem for Passover with the disciples. He referenced it when Mary of Bethany had anointed him. Just as he said. The people that were opposing Jesus knew that he would also be buried and rise on the third day and that he had proclaimed this. So they in Matthew 27, they had said to the chief priests and the Pharisees and went to Pilate, it's in 27 verse 63, remember that while he was still alive, that the deceiver said, after three days I will rise again, so give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. And so Jesus had made the proclamation. It had all, hadn't always been understood. It had sometimes been perplexing. It had been sometimes forgotten. There's a point there. The ones that opposed him didn't forget. They knew. But sometimes even in our, with our good intentions and with our attempts at faithfulness, we forget things that we read in the Bible or we were taught in Sunday school or that we learned along the way. And there's a remedy for that. There's a remedy for it, and it is to be in the Word and to go over the Word and to get back in the Word again and to hear the message again and to understand and to remember to remember in a way that it becomes real, a part of our fiber, our being, our, our existence. So the angel had a message. It is, don't be afraid. Jesus was crucified. He is not here. He is risen from the dead, just as he had said. But the message continued. And this is an important part. So continuing in verse 6. It says, come and see the place where he lay. And then verse 7, then go and quickly tell his disciples. He is risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the rest of the message is, come and see. So the tomb is open, the stone is rolled away, come and see. It's an invitation to come in and an examine. Just come in and examine for yourself. Did Jesus do what he said he would do? Is Jesus really who he said he was? You know, we're invited. We're invited to examine that for ourselves. Is Jesus who he said he was? Did Jesus do what he said he would do? Come and see. Remember, the stone wasn't rolled away so that he could get out. The stone was rolled away so that we could get in. The stone was rolled away so that a barrier would be removed, separating us from knowing our Savior, believing in our Savior, following our Savior. So it's an invitation. It's an invitation. Come and see. We've got nothing to hide here. Actually, we want to show you. Come and see. So it's a come and see, but the rest of the story is go and tell. So it's come and see. And then go and tell. And so they did. Verse 8. So the women hurried away from the tomb. Afraid yet filled with joy. Now what? Okay. All right. Guilty. I'm like this too. The angel just said, don't be afraid. Okay. Okay. And they are obedient to a point. They heard the message, but they are still afraid. Now, their fear may have shifted a little bit. 
You know, the angel might have been shocking. That might have been a fear, a fear factor. The fear that they have now is a fear with joy. They know that he is risen. He is no longer dead. They know he did what he said he would do. They are remembering what he said he would do. They are seeing that he did it. So there is joy. So they are afraid. But they have joy. And their fear has shifted. i got to be truthful. Maybe you're like this. God sometimes asks me in the way that God does ask, by presenting an opportunity or presenting a need or seeing it in his word or being convicted of it by another believer. So God sometimes asks me to do something that I'm a little afraid to do. You know, I'm not used to going to that neighborhood. I'm not used to going and doing that thing that you're convicting me to do. And still, I am to go. And so the women, they still have a little bit of fear. And yet, they go joyfully. And so go with the joy that you know that Jesus lives, that he is with you, that he is for you, that he is victorious, that he is the conqueror, that he is the king of kings. Whatever he asks you to do, he'll equip you to do. That he walks with you and he talks with you and he goes with you. So they were afraid, but they were filled with joy and they were obedient to what the message of the angel was to go and tell. They did it. Oh, they ran to tell his disciples. Go and tell. They ran. I'm telling you, they probably were sprinting. Oh, my goodness. They were making the best time they had ever made. They are going and telling. They're being obedient with some fear, but with joy. They ran to tell his disciples. Come and see. Go and tell. This is amazing. As if, you know, just to reinforce that what the angel's message was came from the Savior, the Savior shows up, and he's going to give the cliff notes of the message. Well, let's take a look. Suddenly, Jesus met them, verse 9. <laughs> Greetings? Okay, I don't know whether Jesus just has a wonderful sense of humor or what, okay? But, I mean, my gosh, this is the, he is freshly resurrected. And greetings is what you got for me? Like, hey, how you doing? I don't know how he really said it, right? I don't know how he really said it. But this word in Greek is, and, and you can look at different translations, but this word in Greek is everything from good morning, to all hail and everything in between. So, you know, I don't know if Jesus is just being all chill with the girls. Hey, <laughs> good morning. Okay, I don't know, but it is striking. It is striking greetings. It is striking that our Savior is that accessible. He is that approachable. Oh, he is Holy, make no mistake about it. He is worthy of worship and of praise. We need to know that he's king of kings and lord of lords, and we need to know our place in that relationship. I am nothing without my Savior. Oh, I am something, but it's lost and pitiful and hopeless without my Savior. So I need to know that he is almighty God, but I also need to know that he is approachable. And he can be chill. And he can say, hey, how you doing? Even when he's freshly minted as a resurrected Savior. Greetings. And they came to him. And they clasped his feet. And they had a very proper response. They worshipped him. And then here's the cliff notes. Reinforcing the message from the angels. 
And Jesus said to them, what? Do not be afraid. And then he says, go and tell my brothers. Okay, now it's kind of switched here a little bit, but it's the same message. Go and tell so that they can come and see. So go and so they can come and see. There you go. That's the message today. All right. Don't be afraid. He was crucified, but he's not anymore dead. He is risen. Come and see. Go and tell. I could stop there, but I won't. (laughs) But wait, there's more. (laughs) So in your worship bulletin, you've got these points that I want to review, sort of as application then of this wonderful message that he is risen. He is risen indeed. But there are some obstacles. There are obstacles in the passage of coming and seeing. There was the stone, the 2,000, 4,000 pound stone. Okay? I need barriers removed so that I have full access You know, I want the premium subscription package of this deal of connecting with Jesus. Okay, I want to have all the channels, all the programs. I want to be full access with Jesus. I need the stones removed. There were other barriers with the stone from the other from the other gospels. There was a seal on the stone. And it wasn't just any seal. It wasn't Mike taking a little bit of duct tape, and here's where the stone is, and here's where the tomb is, and I'm going to put my duct tape on there, and if anybody messes with this, I'm going to see that my duct tape is moved or changed. No, this was the Roman seal. This was the seal that had all of the authority of the Roman Empire behind it. And if you messed with their seal... It meant death. That's a barrier. I need the barriers to my Jesus removed. I need full access. But there are obstacles. Sometimes the obstacles are thinking that, you know, I'm not good enough to go to church. I'm not good enough to be loved by Jesus. My sin is too great. Mm. Greetings, he would say to you. Come, he would say. Remove the barriers. Sometimes the barriers are our good intentions of just being who we are, and we don't realize that a church building can be scary. How do we make it less scary? We don't realize that, oh, our joy of fellowship with each other and our just, oh, I just, I'm so glad to see you this Sunday and oh, I haven't seen you for a few weeks and I'm glad you're here. We don't realize that to a newcomer or a stranger or an unbeliever, that can be like, oh, they all know each other. Okay. That's a barrier. And we don't mean it. Well, we need all the obstacles that we can think of and that we can possibly removed to be removed so that everybody has full access to Jesus. So there was the stone, there was the seal, and then of course there were the Roman guards themselves. Now, we're not exactly told how many guards there are, but we do know how the guards and soldiers operated, and so we can deduce from historical, this is the way they operated, okay? We know that that's the way they operated. I got to tell you, these aren't just regular guy soldiers. You know, they're not the security um, crew that drive around. that has got a little thing that says security on, on the side of the car, okay? This is, no, these men have been trained to torture and to torment and to murder, to get compliance to the expectations of the Roman Empire. 
They are trained in torture and torment and murder, and they are trained as soldiers to fight a battle. And they are equipped. And here's one of the ways they operated. I don't know, it might have been a team of 10 or a team of 16 or the, ex, or, or the common understandings of how this, this group of guards might have been. But if one of the guards, if one of the soldiers let down their guard, if one of them failed in any way, they were all held accountable. And to fail, then you're put to death. So if I'm going to take on the title and the role of being one of those soldiers, if I'm going to take on the title and the role of being one of these guards and they've already figured out that this is really important to guard this tomb because we don't want any stories coming out of this deal. We don't want any stories that are going to come out and make us worse off than we were before we killed Jesus. If he ends up being risen like he said he was going to be due, this is going to, this is going to be a real problem. So guard that tomb. That's a barrier. That's an obstacle. I don't know. Sometimes the obstacles for me being right with God are just so huge and I'm just, I need them to be broken down. I need them to be removed. And Jesus says, just come to me. I am accessible. Greetings. So those are some obstacles. There was an obstacle for him being risen. He was dead, dead. They were so sure that he was dead that after they knew that he was dead, um, they still walked by and pierced him with a sword, his chest into his thorax, and he effused out blood and water. I don't know. You can look at all kinds of different sources. But in 1986, the Journal of the American Medical Association boldly went out on a limb with an article about how the crucifixion killed people. And they were specific to how they killed Jesus. And there was lots of uh, a maelstrom of you know, consternation and angst because the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1986 came out and said, Jesus was crucified and that means he died. You know, they took some heat. Isn't that amazing? They took some heat for an article that crucifixion kills. Well, the Romans knew it killed. And, and, and we need to know that it kills. And so that when Jesus was crucified, he was dead. And so how can he be risen? That's an obstacle to my faith. That's an obstacle to me believing. You know, the Journal of the American Medical Association says before they ever hung him on the cross, he was pretty well gone. You know, he, they said he was hypovolemic. Uh, that means he had lost a lot of blood. It says he was hypoxemic. Uh, that means he didn't have very much oxygen coursing through his body for his muscles to work, for his brain to work, for, his, for him to move, for his heart to pump. So before they ever put him on the cross, he had been beaten, he had been scourged, he had bled out. And then after they were sure that he was dead, they made sure that he was dead. They pierced his chest. These are all obstacles. And the obstacles continue because the rulers of the day had always been plotting just as they were plotting here. We have to have a guards so that no one gets into the tomb. And then if you look in Matthew 28, they plotted after, uh-oh, it happened. Look at Matthew 28, verse 11. We won't unpack that passage, but what you need to say, see, is that they have to come up with a cover story. You are to say, 
his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. So the soldiers took the bribe money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Well, here are some observations to all of these obstacles. It's important. The barriers to Jesus are removed. The angel came. The stone was rolled away. The seal was broken. The guards melted. Feigned death. Jesus is victorious over death. He's risen. He is alive. He lives today. The sin debt is paid. Sin debt is conquered. The tomb was empty. Jesus appeared. He is risen. He is alive. He lives. Praise be to God. Those are all observations from the guards, from the women, from Peter, to the disciples. Those objections, Jesus was not dead when he went into the tomb. That's one. That's an objection people make. Well, no. Not according to common sense, if you just think about it. Not according to the Journal of the American Medical Association. Not to those who knew how crucifixion worked and why the Romans used it. Or here's an objection. The disciples stole the body. How in the world did the disciples steal the body? I mean, remember the training and the number of the guards, the soldiers? I just got to tell you, these, these disciples, they were holed up. Locked in cowering, afraid, confused, perplexed. Peter had denied. So they went out against the Roman guard? Really? If they did, wouldn't there have been a massacre? Wouldn't we have lost some of the disciples that day? Wouldn't that story have been told? I mean, there would have been a battle to the death. I don't think so. Some say uh, they had the wrong tomb. That's an objection. You got the wrong tomb. Yeah, they were in the right neighborhood because there's lots of tombs there. Lots of tombs there. They were in the right neighborhood. They were the wrong address. Oh, wait, what? Oh, that means the guards were at the wrong address. Uh, That means that the Sanhedrin, when they followed up, went to the wrong address. That means that Joseph of Arimathea, who had owned the tomb, didn't know where the tomb was. That's an objection. Then there's the objection that the disciples were delusional or hallucinating. But all of them? The women? Peter later that day? The disciples on the Emmaus Road later that day? The disciples accept Thomas, and then a week later, the disciples including Thomas, and then later, the seven disciples beside the Sea of Galilee, and then later again in Galilee, the apostles plus 500 plus James, the half-brother of Jesus, who didn't believe Jesus was the Savior until after this resurrection experience. All of them are delusional. Those who witnessed him at his ascension, the Saul of Tarsus, who on the way to Damascus of Syria meets Jesus, he's on his way at the bequest of the chief priest to arrest and bring back Jesus' followers so that they can be questioned and ultimately killed. And he encounters Jesus. And he makes a U-turn. And he becomes the biggest evangelist, church planner, missionary, Advocate for you and for I and for the whole world to know the Savior, Jesus Christ. How about this objection? I believe some things in the Bible, but not everything. So I'm not going to believe that. Uh, That's been called Dalmatian theology. You know, like the dog. I'm going to leave this spot of Scripture and that spot of Scripture, but not all of Scripture. Dalmatian theology that only inspired in spots. Or how about the objection? Well, 
You have your truth, and I have my truth, but there is an ultimate truth to the ultimate question. And that ultimate question is, did Jesus rise from the dead? With you have your truth and I have mine, then one of us is right and one of us is wrong. And i got to tell you that there is an ultimate truth, and you can imagine it. Here's the deal. Tomorrow, I've got my bank statement in hand. I've balanced my checkbook. I've got my receipts for my deposits. I go to the teller at my bank, and I say, I'd like to withdraw $100 today. And the teller says, I don't think so. I feel like you don't have any money in your account. I believe you don't have any money in your account. Now, wait a minute. I got my statement. I got my deposit slips. I want my $100. You see, there is an ultimate truth to the ultimate question, did Jesus rise from the dead? And if you're a Christian, the Apostle Paul says, if this resurrection thing isn't true, and this is paraphrased from 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 15, 1 Corinthians 15. If this isn't true, you, we as believers, are the most of all men to be pitied. Here's why. Because if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then he's not the Messiah. And if he's not the Messiah, then he's not the Lamb of God. And then if he's not the Lamb of God, then his death on the cross didn't cover my sin debt. And if he didn't cover my sin debt, then I'm not redeemed. And if I'm not redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, then I am lost and I am hopeless. And there is no way for me to be made right. So there is an ultimate truth to the ultimate question, did Jesus rise from the dead? And you can use Dalmatian theology, but then you're going to the punchline is, going to live like a dog. <laughs> or you can use the, what's true for me isn't necessarily true for you. And the problem with that is, one of us is right, and one of us is wrong. And in the come see, go tell message, we're asked to come and see, to examine the Bible, examine the scripture, all of scripture to examine the evidence, come and see. We're invited to come and see. And then when we receive it as our truth, to go and tell. To go and tell. So today, on this Resurrection Sunday, that's the message. Come and see and go and tell so that others can come and see and go and tell. Heavenly Father, we come to you prayerfully, thoughtfully, just imagining your love for us so great. You sent your one and only begotten Son. And your only begotten Son's love for us is so great that he sacrificed himself on a cross to pay our sin debt so that we could be redeemed by the blood of the lamb, the perfect lamb, the only one that can cover our sin debt, Jesus Christ. And we want people to know that this Jesus loves them and that he is accessible. And we pray, Father, that we are not an obstacle, that we help people come and see so that they can receive and go and tell. Oh, we worship you, our risen Savior. It's in Christ Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen. Now the praise team is going to close us out with um, a time of response. And we're going to stand and sing in during that time of response. And I invite you to come and see and talk to me and pray with me and let me know your prayer requests with me or where you are. But it is important that you have that moment with Jesus on Resurrection Sunday. After we close out with the invitation song, I just have a couple of announcements and we will send you off so that you can continue to celebrate this glorious day.
Resurrection Sunday. Amen. If you're able to, let's stand and sing alive forever. Amen. We lost Mike. There he is. Okay. God is alive. Amen. And he's moving in our midst. And he cares for you. And sometimes we don't realize how close he is until we're just desperate. And then he's right there. And we need to know that. He is alive. Church, he is risen. He is risen indeed. This week as we dismiss, I ask that you be mindful of our pastor emeritus, our former pastor, our man, kind and gentle man we call Brother Don, Don Weidman. He is ill, not doing well, so please pray for him and his family this week. Then I also want to send you with this announcement that we're sending a group of, of teens to camp. We're sending chaperones. We're going to have a fundraiser, and it's going to be fun in the fundraiser yeah. next Sunday, right after this service. We're doing a lunch right here to raise money to send those students and chaperones to camp. So pl come planning to eat here and give to that cause. Well, he is alive. He is risen. 
He loves you. He cares for you. Walk with him. Abide with him. Go to him. He'll greet you, and he will just love you. He is a wonderful Savior. Happy Easter. Worthy is the Lamb, worthy of our praise. Worthy is the one who has overcome the grave. Let the people dance, let the people sing. Worthy is the mighty King. Worthy is the Lamb, worthy of our praise. Worthy is the one who has overcome the grave. Let the people dance, let the people sing. Worthy is the mighty King. Worthy is the Lamb, worthy of our praise. Worthy is the one who has overcome.